chapter 3, verse 16 to 21. That's page 833 in your church Bible. So, that's John chapter 3, verse 16 to 21. A famous verse in verse 3, 16. So we all think more or less every Christian in the world probably know John 3, 16. But the question is, do you know the rest of that? So let's, let's give it a read. It said this, So God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their works were evil. Because everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. For whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Sorry, the translation I'm reading is from the English Standard Version, so it's going to be a slight different from yours, but it's the same context nonetheless. So, the Gospel. The gospel is something every Christian would kind of have an idea of, right? The gospel, Jesus died, buried, rose again. We find that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Paul saying it is of first importance because you don't get this right. I doubt you're going to get a lot of other things right. But what is the gospel? Do we understand it as we should? Here's a picture. I liken the gospel to a painting. A painting which seems so simple, right? It's a famous painting by Van Gogh, actually. It doesn't really seem like much, but actually there's a hidden meaning behind it. You see, the person who's in white actually represents Jesus. The 12 people in this picture are actually representing the 12 apostles. And there's one shadowy figure who we know in the Last Supper was Judas Iscariot, walking through the door. If you look behind, there's a cross in the window pane and many other little small details. And I liken the gospel to that. A painting that we think, you know, just a cafe, just a lovely little painted cafe, but actually has a deeper meaning. So, how do we understand the gospel? What is the gospel? Well, I can give you three things we can go to. I've got the three S's, right? Sin, salvation, solution. To understand the gospel, we first got to understand these three things and how do they play the part in our Christian world today. Let's start with the first one, sin. In Romans 5, verse 12 to 13, it tells us, right, about how sin entered the world through Adam. How Adam, unfortunately, disobeyed God in the garden. And because of that disobedience, again, we're in the situation we have now. So it reads here, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because of all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin <coughs> is not counted when there is no law. What's that basically saying here? Because of what's happened with Adam, because of that sin in the garden, unfortunately we put us in a really bad situation where we sin ourselves, Sin is into the world, so the perfect design that God has for this planet, this world, is corrupted because of that. And unfortunately, the whole world is guilty of sin. And why is that? People say, it's not fair. Well, that's Adam and Eve, that's not me. But I question you, my friend. Have you lied before? Stolen something you haven't, that doesn't belong to you? Or maybe have you, again, even having done that physically, how about in your heart? Jesus said, if you do these things, right, for example, murder, murder isn't exactly hurting someone, it's actually the intentions of the heart. And our heart is very sick, my friends, our heart needs help. And the payment for sin requires a sacrifice. So what is sin in the Bible? Right, don't need to go all these terms, but let's just go really quickly here. So deviation from God's law. That basically means God has some laws set out for people. Some people have gone away from it. We can liken this to the Israelites in the wilderness. Or when they went into, of course, the Promised Land. They started worshipping different gods. They started doing different things that God didn't want them to do. A description of state. What do I mean by that? 
In Romans chapter number 24, this famous phrase that Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? But thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord, and it ends on that. What Paul's basically saying here, Paul wants to do good things that are good. Paul wants to do things which are right in God's eye, but there's something in him that is preventing that. Where even when he wants to do good, he can't. And when he wants, doesn't want to do bad, and wants to do good, it, it's, it's a conflict, right? And unfortunately, because of Adam, we're all in the state. Augustine used the terminology of original sin. That's where that theological term comes from. Or sin nature. But we can tell in ourselves that like, there is a problem. There is something in us. And deliberate rebellion, that goes similar to the deviation of God's law, but it's a little bit more, how I should say, significant. Adam and Eve literally heard God's, well, Eve actually heard God saying, I'm sure Adam did as well, do not eat of the tree of good and evil. They heard that very clearly. And what did they do next? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're in a, unfortunately, we're in the front of that to this day. And it's not just their fault, we also contribute with our own sin and our own problems. And the last thing is devious actions and attitudes. What I mean by that, things like murder, adultery, all these things. Again, all this stems from the top one, disobeying God's laws. Perfect examples, Cain. Cain and Abel were, again, doing their thing. Abel's sacrifices were again accepted by God. Cain wasn't. And what did Cain do? He slayed his brother in cold blood. Haman, we are going over the book of Esther. Haman made a plot to kill all the Jewish people. David, though he was a man after God's heart, he was by no means perfect. Though he may be called by God, that doesn't mean you're perfect. If anything, it means there's a greater responsibility. And David, of course, we know the stories, he slept with Bathsheba and sent one of his friends, his best soldier on the front line to be killed. And the last name we all know, Judas Iscariot, who will follow Jesus for three years in his ministry, but towards the end, he, of course, betrayed him. So this is sin in the Bible. And of course, as I mentioned here, Genesis chapter 3 is the example of that. Satan makes God's laws like bondage. Satan makes the laws of God boring. Oh, why are you following God for? What are you being all holy for? It's boring. It's useless. But he prints sin as freedom. When in the reality, he's flipped it around. That's what Satan does. He flips things around. And because of that, our world is in a state of decay and death. And our minds and our own desires are not even seeking God. Sometimes, even our best efforts, we like to seek God, but it seems like it just so happens our favourite series on TV, or just so happens something just turned up in the phone or we've got to meet a friend. Our desires are out of touch with God when there is a problem. And because of this, we have death, we have evil, and we have suffering. And that's the problem we have. But it doesn't stop there, because we have salvation. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it's a famous verse that there is no name under heaven or earth by men might be saved but the name of Jesus. Sin shows us we need a savior. The painter, the, sorry, the image I just painted should make you think, how on earth can we solve this problem? Is it a religion, a new philosophy? An idea? A leader? Because they sin too. What is the solution? And the thing is, our desires in this world are for good, right? Some of our desires, what I mean by that, right? We have a tendency for justice. When we see a heinous criminal like Hitler, we're just talking about Remembrance Day, right? Hitler, who done such atrocity, we want justice. We want him to be put away. Why and where does this come from? It must come from God. It must come from the bigger picture here. And it can't come from ourselves because again, sin. Sin has clouded our vision, in fact, blinded our eyes. But as I continue, better yet, we need a medium. We need someone to stand in the gap for us. We need someone who isn't, again, in sin. Someone who isn't driven by their own selfish desires. 
We need someone like Jesus. Why Jesus? You ever thought about that question? Why Jesus? There's many religious prophets. There's Muhammad, Confucius. There's even great men who lived before even Jesus, you would say. But why is it that is Jesus? And why is he called the Lamb? You see, when he was, again, when John the Baptist saw him, I imagine before the Jordan, he must have been preaching. Everyone's thinking, John, what are you, what are you on about? Where is this man that you talk about? Then he sees Jesus walking by. And he doesn't say, this is the Son of God, everyone worship him. Or, this is the, the best man to ever live. He said, this is, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Why? Well, I've got a bit of an idea here. A lamb has to be, again, without blemish and spot. That's what the Old Testament required for a sacrifice, a perfect lamb. Jesus was sinless. He takes that box. Born from a virgin. Now, we celebrate Christmas because, again, of that reason. He was born of a virgin, a miraculous birth. But how do I liken that to a lamb? You see, because in order for a sacrifice to be made, the sacrifice had to be slain. Now, you probably think that's common sense, right? But here, here's the real amazing work of God. Christ came down, born from a virgin. That means he was fully man. He could feel pain, he was hungry, he was tempted in the wilderness. That means he could be slain. That means he could be killed. That means that he could be just like us, helpless in our flesh. But here's another thing. The lamb wasn't provided by mankind. It wasn't by a religious leader that they sent to the cross. It was sent from heaven. The Lamb of God was sent from heaven. Christ was sent from heaven on a rescue mission to be slain, to be crucified as a payment for sin. Now, here's a cross we all see. You know, there's a cross even up there. Probably around our necks, probably by many places we've seen a cross. But I like to say two things. Two things met the cross, actually. Justice. Mercy. Why, why do I use these two words? You see, justice is what we deserve. We've sinned. In many of these verses I show on the board, it clearly says the wages of sin is death. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the sin of us all. That's the justice that we deserve. But it was made on the cross. And why, where's mercy? Here's mercy. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That though we deserve that blow, Though we deserve that hit from God, he took it. He took the shame. He took the insults. He took the people spitting in his face, pulling out his beard, whipping him with 40 lashes with the cat and nine tails. He took all of that. And again, that's the mercy of God. And that's, again, the picture with the cross paints. It's not just a symbol of this deed is dying, but actually, it's God's justice and mercy meeting that God, God laid on him the sins of us. We should have been on that cross, really. He's done, we've done wrong. But Christ was innocent. That goes back to what I said before. He's a lamb, that spotless lamb who went willingly. That's what I'm saying before, our desires are for ourselves. But Christ went willingly so that we may be set free. So as I continue on, Remember what I said about how we have evil in this world? The cross brings good. Remember how I said that in this world we have suffering? He brings peace. And last thing, remember how I said we have death in this world? That resurrection brings life. You see, because Christ himself is the answer to all of these things. Christ in himself is the answer to death, pain, suffering. Because he not only he's been through it all, but he helps us to go through it. And the fact is, the resurrection itself shows that there is a hope. That though this world be me, full of sin, full of pain, there is a hope. And what is that hope? This is where it comes to the solution. In Acts chapter 26, verse 15 to 18, it is the account of Paul to King Agrippa. And it's one of my favorite verses because it reminds me of the mission that Christ told Paul. And I believe that mission also spreads to us, the Great Commission as well. But it says here, in verse 18 onwards, sorry, verse 15 onwards, excuse me. And he, I said, who are you, Lord? 
And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to anoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I have appeared to delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their blind eyes, that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What did I just read? What I just read is a mission that Christ gave to Paul the Apostle. Saul, who was once on the way to, to sin, Paul saw on the way to persecute Christians, but yet Christ said, arise on him. He could have beaten down and said, you know, you wicked man, how could you do that to my people? But his mercy was shown, up upon your feet, I've got a new purpose for you. Up upon your feet, I am going to make you a witness. And that's the same hand of Jesus that spreads to us now. That he gives us a mission, a purpose. And it's not by our own strength, by the Holy Spirit. Because on that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down as flames of fire, he gave the power to the apostles, the, those in the upper room, to go out and share the gospel. Because they can never do it on their own strength, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, but I always say this, he mends us to send us. You see, God is in the business of men making us whole. God wants us to change our desires, to change our thoughts, to change our passions and our lusts and all sorts of things and make it in line with his desire. And because of that, we can make a change in the world we live in today. Now, I'm not one to say, okay, we can all rescue this whole world. This world is falling apart. Unfortunately, it's going to take a lot to fix it. And unfortunately, it is subject to decay. But why am I so focused on that? Because of this reason. We prepare for the eternal kingdom by restoring the brokenness in this fallen world. Someone mentioned the olive branch, Rose mentioned the olive branch, right? Broken people in these places. This is only a highlight of what we ought to do. Helping those who are in bondage to help on all these things. It may not be that specific situation, but there's other things around. But the point is this. By us being changed from the inside, we can also make a change from the outside those situations in other people's lives and that's what God is going to do he want to build us up to help us to purify to make us holy as I said sanctified by faith in me make us holy make us more like him so that we can help others with a pure conscience and serve God with a pure conscience and I have to finish off with a final quote the gospel is hope for the hopeless salvation for sinners and a promise mightier than death what I'm trying to finish off with here is that the gospel isn't just a couple tenets that you read. It isn't just going to church. It isn't even just about, you know, reading your Bible and you living your life. The gospel is a transformation of your life and a transformation of the world around us. That we should be active as Christians in the gospel. Sharing it wherever you are because it's good news. The gospel means God's good news. It is good news that people can be set free from sin. It is good news that people can be given hope and given a promise of eternal life. And because of that, we should go out and share it more. Because of that, we should really think about it more and center our entire lives around it, in our work lives, in our family lives, in our relationships. Center our entire life around the gospel. So let's pray and let's sing our final song.